right. Hello, everyone. This is Hadley Matthews from Apt Associates, and I want to welcome you to today's office hours on COVID-19. We have a great team of community members and um, federal partners and practitioners that we will hear from today and are looking forward to hearing from all of you as well. So on the next two slides, I'm just going to give a couple of very brief reminders and uh, statistical information for us all. So this event uh, is being recorded, a recording of the event along with the slide deck and a copy of all the content that's being captured through the questions and answers box and the chat box. All of that will be posted to the HUD exchange within two to three business days. So please do give us a couple days, but we promise we will get that information up there. Um, you can find on the link that is on the screen and that I will put in the chat box in just a moment. You can find information on upcoming webinars as well as all of the content that we have from the previous office hours and webinars that we have done. And on the next slide, we're just going to go over, I'm just going to go over very briefly how to connect with us today. So one of the best parts um, of these office hours is hearing from all of you and hearing the questions that you have um, and sharing, uh, again, sort of what you're doing in the field. So unfortunately, you can't verbally speak with us today, but we do have a chat feature that we strongly encourage everyone to use for the duration of our time together. So to find that chat feature, just look on your screen and you will see what looks like a little messages bubble. There's an arrow pointing to it right now. And when you click on that, it'll open up the chat box for you. When you are sending messages, and please send everything in um, if possible through the chat box, questions, comments that you may have. Um, when you are sending a message of any sort, please be sure to make sure that it is set to go to all participants. So it should default to all participants, but just in case that menu does not default to all participants, please go ahead and just click on the little arrow on your screen um, in that chat box and you will be able to scroll down and see find hopefully all participants. And with that really brief overview, I'm going to now turn things over to Nolan Sikar, who is the Director of HUD's Office of Special Needs Assistance Programs. Nolan? Thank you very much, Natalie. I'm going, going to quickly walk through the speakers for today and uh, the agenda. So. Uh, We'll have presentations for, from Emily Masitis from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. Uh, we will have a uh, presentation from the uh, Barbara DePietro, De sorry, from the National Healthcare for the Homeless Council. Uh, and we have uh, a great feature uh, presentation. Uh, we have speakers from uh, Yakima County, Washington, uh, and from Hennepin County, Minnesota, uh, who are going to talk about alternative care sites. Uh, so we're very excited about the, those presentations uh, and uh, very much looking forward to, uh, to, to hearing from them. Uh, we also have Karma, he Karma Heisman from the Department of Veterans Affairs who's going to give a VA update. So our agenda for today, as I mentioned, we'll get updates from uh, CDC, a uh, presentation on uh, medical respite care and alternative care sites, uh, and updates from HUD and VA. And with that, I'm going to turn things over to Emily Masitis from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. Emily? Hi, everyone. This is Emily Masitis, Unit in the COVID-19 Response at CDC. Next slide. So I'm, I'm presenting data a little bit differently today. Uh, we have, as of yesterday, over 1 million cases reported in the United States. Normally here I show a map, but I thought it would be useful to show the outbreak curve. So this is the national outbreak curve that we look at to see whether or not the number of cases per day are coming down. That will tell us, ultimately that will tell us when we're on the tail end of the outbreak. Um, but we can see here though that the number of cases per day, so the y-axis is number of cases and it's the date across the bottom, are at a pretty high plateau. So we're, we're waiting for them to still come back down. And these outbreak curves look different across states and across uh, local counties. So um, the places where the outbreak curve is coming down, that's, those are the locations that are able to consider reopening. So I just wanted to give you that update for some situational awareness. Next slide. 
And then again, um, a reminder of what guidance we have on our website. We have our shelter and service provider guidance that was updated, um, I think, about two weeks ago at this point. So if you haven't checked back in the last two weeks, check that out. We are in the process of updating our unsheltered guidance so that it will match the template of the shelter guidance. So um, that should be hopefully posted um, early next week. Next slide. And then the other CDC materials that we have, the landing page itself has a different format, but it's the same information. We have the FAQs, we have communications materials, a symptom screening tool, and then there's also a, a different location for those scientific reports that came out about uh, two weeks ago now. Um, those are on the MMWR website. So if you're looking for those reports, those were the scientific reports related to universal testing events in various shelters and also outbreak investigation in Seattle. Next slide. And that's all for me. Again, just a reminder that uh, if you have questions for us at CDC, you can call CDC info. Um, that, can, that will be rooted to um, an inquiries desk in the COVID-19 response. So hopefully we'll be able to link you to the right information. Thanks so much. Thanks, Emily. And I wonder if I could just ask a couple quick questions uh, while we have you here. You mentioned the updates to the shelter guidance from a couple weeks ago and the update uh, forthcoming to the uh, unsheltered guidance. Can you just give a quick summary of what changed in the sheltered guidance and maybe what might what you expect to see change in the sheltered guidance, uh, sorry, the unsheltered guidance? Yeah, so um, as we label all of our guidances as interim guidance since we're learning so much every day about this virus, so we, uh, we do a process of updating. Um, the shelter guidance update, and, uh, it was really a, a reformatting for clarity, highlight the areas that we want to have a little bit more focus, a little bit more clarity around the types of personal protective equipment that staff should be using and the clock that we want everyone to be using in shelter settings. Um, and then some updated understanding of making sure that we are very clear that it's possible for people to be asymptomatically infected and that those people might be able to transmit the infection as well. So we want to have that awareness. Um, and, uh, when we're thinking about screening for symptoms, that that's a really good way to help connect people to medical care. So that's, that's kind of the essence of the update there. And when we, uh, when we get the unsheltered guidance update, it's really uh, similar. What we, want, what we hope to do is make it a good analog to the shelter guidance so it, it can have a lot of the same components in it and uh, template-wise it'll match. So just some updates for clarity, updates um, to our understanding, and hopefully that will be out next week. Great, thank you so much, Emily. Uh, so I wanna introduce our next speaker here. Uh, next up, we have Barbara DePietro from the National Healthcare for the Homeless Council. She's gonna present some resources and uh, introduce our, uh, our other guests. Barbara, the floor is all yours. Thanks so much, Norm. Really appreciate being here uh, again to, to talk about an emerging issue that, that uh, something that we, a lot of us are, are struggling with in, communities. If we could go to the next slide, please. Uh, so we have a new issue brief really responding to a number of questions that we're getting at the council and that the HUD uh, TA team has been getting about how we are staffing and providing the services in the alternate care sites. And so a lot of these questions are circulating around a model of care actually known as medical respite care. Uh, and so what medical respite care is, is really acute and post-acute care for people who are homeless, who are ready for hospital discharge, but they're just too sick or they're just, they need recuperation time uh, and that they can't do that uh, effectively, either on the streets or in shelters. And so when we think about like medical shelter beds, or we think about a way to be able to put more medical supports around people who are in shelters, uh, that's really what we're talking about in terms of medical respite care. Uh, right now in this environment where so many of us are standing up isolation and quarantine spaces, 
uh, where we're taking very vulnerable people and putting them in either congregate or non-congregate settings. Uh, they bring with them all of the healthcare conditions that they had prior to COVID. Uh, and so thinking about how we use this as an opportunity, uh, not just to either protect people from uh, becoming COVID uh, involved uh, or addressing uh, their, their infection, but also thinking about how we use this as an opportunity uh, for greater connection to care, uh, greater stability and more permanent um, placements as people are leaving isolation and quarantine. So really the central goal that we're looking to do is how do we make alternate care sites safe and healing spaces so that support services can stabilize the health conditions? Uh, next slide, please. And so we really were thinking about this in terms of three different areas of uh, facilities, staffing and services, and then of course, uh, how it's funded. So just to kind of break it down, and this is a framework, I'm really excited that my colleagues from Yakima and uh, from Hennepin County are, are here to talk about their programs uh, because they're really good examples of how these programs can be not only set up uh, in communities just at any time, but also how we can be using these models uh, to be thinking about uh, greater stability and comprehensiveness of the supports we're creating now, and again, that longer term view. Uh, so when we think about like the types of facilities where we see medical respite care uh, normally, again, even prior to COVID, it's a really flexible model. So this can be in shelters or missions, this can be in healthcare clinics, uh, it can, they can take place in supportive or transitional housing programs. Uh, some medical respite programs are, are actually pretty high uh, medical models that are freestanding uh, facilities on their own. Uh, and then there are other models that use motel rooms or apartment units to be able to do um, uh, non-congregate uh, respite care. So it, there's a lot of flexibility there. And I think that in a COVID environment, thinking, uh, so many people are thinking creatively, uh, how can you be making the most of your shelter capacity to maybe uh, set aside some sick rooms? And this is often happening right now as we're kind of thinking through all of the space that we have for people who may test positive or are awaiting testing, but thinking about how that might, um, that might look. Uh, other spaces in the community, again, everyone's looking for the congregate or non-congregate options for people to stay. Uh, we obviously are looking at the hotel and motel model, so a lot of communities um, putting that in place, particularly so that we can be doing um, more targeted uh, services. It makes it a little easier in, in the non-congregate sites. Uh, and then one piece, too, to consider is accessibility. Uh, and this isn't just for people who have um, formally declared disabilities, but we have a lot of canes, walkers, people who've got real limited mobility who may not be able to do stairs or just thinking through how accessible the space is. Um, so that's just a few comments about what the actual physical uh, facility space looks like. Uh, next slide. But I think that the real key here to this is the staffing and services. And, and that's the real thrust of medical respite care broadly. Uh, and I think the potential for the alternate care sites is how are we really com combining uh, the services and appropriate staff to be able to support people's healthcare conditions. Uh, and so when we think about the staffing, this doesn't necessarily need to be all of these services that are provided on site. Um, but it does mean that there's an active connection to these services so that we're making sure that people get the care that they need. And so it can be a wide range uh, of a package of services, but really the comprehensive health care that folks need, particularly connection to specialty care. Um, and then when we think about medication management, uh, particularly if you're supporting the medically frail or those that are older or, or the more high risk population that we're trying to put in spaces where to protect them from uh, COVID-19 infection. Uh, these folks, is not uncommon for people to be on six, 10, maybe a dozen medications. And this is the kind of thing is as we're disrupting folks in their normal routine, uh, how are we being mindful that insulin still is delivered? asthma inhalers are still delivered, that people still have their suboxone, that people are, are able to manage their blood pressure. And I think particularly as our food, um, access to food has been a big issue. And we, we've talked about that uh, in, in, in this space as well, is a lot of healthcare conditions are, are predicated on getting a healthy and nutritious diet. And so when we think about diabetes and hypertension in particular, two very common chronic illnesses, 
uh, these are the types of things that can really create um, some, some negative health outcomes while they are in the hotel, motel spaces, or in some of our alternate care settings. So thinking through, like, who is making sure that your clients are getting their medications and that they're managed well, uh, that this is an opportunity for us to do health education, uh, and especially an opportunity for us to do any uh, coordinated entry or housing assistance to be able to make sure people are getting lined up for permanent uh, placement. And so as we're thinking through what this looks like in a COVID environment, one of the things that we want to be particularly mindful is having someone to perform health assessments uh, when people are coming into alternate care sites and then actively connecting or uh, people to those services. And whether that can be provided on site is obviously ideal, but if that means just partnering with some of your community folks uh, to come in and maybe do some rounds, uh, or whatever that might look like, I think really making sure that people are getting that connection. And then one of the pieces, too, that we're often um, conscious of right now is many of the staff that are providing the supports at alternate care sites may not have uh, a deep history serving people experiencing homelessness. So thinking about how this staff is trained on trauma-informed care, de-escalation, harm reduction, just all of that so that people are familiar with how to interact with folks that bring a really high level of need uh, and so that we can be supporting people well. Uh, making sure that we're doing well client checks every day, at least once a day, whether through telephone or in person if that's possible. And then really, again, thinking through how are we completing housing applications and thinking uh, more uh, more permanently in terms of ideally we can take our, our folks from the hotel motel space and then into permanent housing. Uh, so that's obviously ideal and I think that's the challenge too is, is thinking more permanently. Uh, next uh, slide please. And then of course it's always about funding. So um, part of this too is um, when we think about medical respite care prior to COVID, uh, this is a lot of healthcare, understandably some healthcare funding streams. So hospitals in particular are the ones who benefit from medical respite care, in particular because these are settings that normally provide a safe discharge option for people who no longer need a hospital level of care, but any one of us would have been discharged to home for rest and recuperate. So what does that mean in a shelter environment or for people who may be unsheltered? Uh, so hospitals have been a big funder uh, and supporter of medical respite care. Um, state and local funds, uh, grants and such, private donations, and Medicaid and MCOs have been providing a lot more um, support in this area. And now in an environment of COVID, where we now have additional funding streams from FEMA, uh, and then along the HUD funding streams, either CDBG or ESG, maybe HOPWA funds, thinking through how we can use those, um, those funding streams uh, to deliver the services and package the services as, along with the residential uh, piece. I think that's really the, the combination that yields the best outcomes. And, and so those are the three areas that our funding or that our issue brief um, covers. But I think before I turn it over to my friends from Yakima, I just wanted to talk about the opportunity that we have for really doing, doing more for the folks that we have in our ACS programs where for the first time, uh, and, and I'm, I'm talking to colleagues of mine who are doing direct care, who talk about their clients for the first time getting a solid night's sleep in a real bed with a real pillow behind a door that locks with their own bathroom, and, and, and all of a sudden transformations are happening and people are feeling like they are more uh, able to participate in their own care and their own decision making and direction. Uh, I know personally of a number of clients who are just absolutely thrilled to feel safe for the first time in a long time because they have a hotel room where they're able to take a bath um, whenever they want uh, and sit in there as long as they want. And, and I think we, we forget how dehumanizing uh, homelessness can be, particularly for folks who are in shelters and, and, and in encampments. And really this opportunity for people to be feeling better, that this is an opportunity for them and an opportunity for us to think more permanently about how we make use of the 14 days or whatever it is that people are staying with us. And so that's the vision for, for what we can be doing for more permanent solutions. Um, but I'm just excited about the opportunity uh, and the improvements that we're seeing in so many people right now and, uh, and how we're, we're using this opportunity. 
Uh, so with that, please let me uh, turn it over to my colleagues. Uh, the next slide uh, in Yakima County, who run a fantastic program, and Esther and Rhonda will, will tell you all about it. So I will turn it over to them. Thank you. Well, thank you, Barbara. This is Rhonda Hoff. Uh, you can go ahead and go to the next slide, if you would. So if you don't know uh, where Yakima County is, this is us on the left. The dark green blot here is South Central Washington State. A couple of weeks ago, we were known for having the highest COVID rate in, in uh, the state and now the highest rate on the West Coast. 63% of our workforce are considered essential workers, mostly in agriculture and healthcare. Economically, we have a lot of poverty with many people living in close quarters and socially, many of people still aren't adjusting well to the need for social distancing. Currently, our county is testing, uh, our testing rate in our county is almost 20% compared to our state's rate of 7.1%. Next slide, please. This is Yakima Neighborhood Health Services. We're first and foremost a community health center, a health care provider. We have eight sites in the valley, both rural and metropolitan, and this is our 45th anniversary. In 2005, we became a health care for the homeless provider, and in 2007, started our first contract with HUD to provide permanent support of housing. Because of our health care infrastructure, our niche in our continuum of care is serving the chronically homeless, those with chronic medical and mental health conditions. Our teams include nurses, behavioral health specialists, case managers, outreach workers, and housing specialists. Next slide. This is who we are as an organization. Neighborhood Health provides full scope primary care services for all ages. And you can see here on the left are the scope of our services. For people experiencing homelessness, we have additional services like supportive housing, medical respite care, and state and local funds to support additional leads like a coordinated entry, rental assistance, diversion, and transportation. Our homeless services represent 14% of our business and sometimes 90% of our time. Next slide. In our county, we have a strong continuum of care, which includes many organizations. We serve both metropolitan and rural communities. The city of Yakima has about 100,000 people, but some of our smaller, more rural communities have just a few hundred people. Our outreach teams work in towns as well as very rural parts of the county, including the Yakima Reservation. We have emergency shelters that are designated for youth and young adults, a sanctioned encampment, and many unsanctioned encampments. Here in the bottom right corner are snapshots of one of our medical respite programs. This particular building has single one-bedroom apartments. As the need for COVID isolation ramps up, we're putting twin beds in these units so that we can accommodate two people in each apartment instead of just one. Next slide. Medical respite care is basically emergency shelter with medical oversight. We have two primary goals in our program. The first is to reduce admissions or readmissions to the hospital. And the second is that when people exit respite care, they leave to stable housing. This isn't always possible because in ours, like many programs, available rental housing is very scarce to come by. Next slide. In our program, we have over 80 units of supportive housing right now, and we've had a lot of questions about why we got so heavy into housing over the years. The Institute of Healthcare Improvement, or the IHI, identifies several measures of success in its framework of the triple aim to improve health, lower costs, and improve the patient experience. A few years ago, we identified eight of those measures that we believe directly related to improving health for people experiencing homelessness if they have housing, along with supportive housing and case management services. We put our client's HMIS number into our electronic health record so we can track these health outcomes and we compare them to our general population. Next slide. This is one example of one of those outcomes. When we exit a patient from the respite program, we do a 30-day look back to see if they have had, been to a hospital anywhere in the state of Washington. Studies have shown that homeless patients who access medical respite care required 50% fewer hospital readmissions following medical respite stays than patients who did not have access to a medical respite program. And next slide. 
This chart compares the average charge of a hospital stay in Yakima County for depression care for a rehab stay and compares them to the average cost of medical respite care. When we can safely provide quality care for our patients needing medical oversight, we make a huge dent in the public costs associated with hospital utilization. Medical respite has been shown to reduce hospital readmission rates, which reduces the cost even more. Now I'd like to introduce Esther Magasis, my colleague from Yakima County, who oversees our continuum of care. Thank you, Rhonda. I appreciate you going through those slides. And um, thank you, everybody, for tuning in to what we have to say from Yakima County. Um, the homelessness, the homeless response system COVID planning um, has has really kind of been rooted in three major streams of funding from the county side. And that's um, an emergency housing grant that we we're given from the state um, and our consolidated homeless grant, which um, the emergency housing grant was actually an extension of. We also have tried to tap into some FEMA funds for response as well. Um, and of course, there's other organizations in the county that we're partnering with who have their own funding streams as well. But specific to the homeless system, those are three major sources that we're looking at. Um, we've been working with representatives and leadership from the county, as well as from the health, health district, the Office of Emergency Management, and the city of Yakima, which is our largest city in the county. We've also worked closely with our providers like uh, YNHS, uh, Yakima Neighborhood Health Services, who Rhonda represents, um, other shelter providers. Um, we work with foundations to create public-private partnerships. Um, and we've also worked, it's not listed here because it's still something we're developing, but we're in the process of working with Yakima Nation, which is a, our local tribal entity as well. Oh, went too far. So uh, the two primary focus points of our action plan that we've developed are prevention and preparation. Um, prevention was increasing distancing and sanitation in congregate settings to reduce transmission. So uh, one of our strategies was the use of tents at shelters to increase space and airflow. A number of our shelters that have people living indoors in a shelter um, wanted to be able to spread the distance out between each bed to get that six feet of separation that was recommended without having to sacrifice the number of people who they could host on a night. So we bought some military-style barrack tents um, we bought a bunch of sub-zero sleeping bags and we've helped expand, ex expand the amount of space between beds in our shelters and congregate living facilities. Um, getting these tents we found has also, luckily we're in an area where the climate allows this, it doesn't get too cold um, and people can sleep comfortably more or less um, outdoors. The, and we found that the airflow is a lot better out there than some of the congregate sites as well, um, which we think has helped reduce transmission. Uh, we also have worked on pre-isolation of high-risk individuals in congregate settings. So the Union Gospel Mission has a number of individuals who um, had pre-existing health conditions that would have made them very high risk. And before any of this happened, when people started the stay-at-home order, um, UGM went ahead and moved them into their own isolated rooms and uh, have all, they've also reconfigured the way that the shelter is set up so that the dining hall um, has shifts for when meals are done to reduce the number of people in there at any given time and has two separate entrances and exits for folks who are either high risk or families with children to enter through a different area than um, other folks will enter through to try and reduce transmission again. Um, we also extended some of our extreme winter weather shelters, one of them specifically for young adults to increase the capacity of our shelters. And we have partnered with some of the local foundations, as I mentioned on the previous slide, to purchase and distribute sanitation supplies and other needs that shelters have right now. One thing that we've seen is that, I'm sure it's true in every community, um, the fundraising efforts of a lot of nonprofits locally have also been uh, damaged a little by this situation. Folks are seeing reduced income, so they're, they're donating less. And um, it, it also cut into the fundraising season for our, a number of our nonprofits. So we've been able to set up a partnership with our local foundations um, where they can cover some of the 
um, needs of shelters with their flexible funds, and we can fill in things that are covered by our grant funding, sanitation supplies, PPE, stuff like that. Um, the other leg of our plan is preparation, um, and this is the, the attempt to develop a plan for isolation and recovery beds before they're needed. Um, this has been where medical respite has really come into play. Um, we're currently trying to continue to expand the current medical respite that we have through YNHS, um, preparing to increase the number of beds as needed when we have positive cases. Uh, Rhonda had mentioned that Yakima County is becoming infamous for having the highest rate of COVID positive tests um, in the West Coast. Luckily, we are, um, we're not seeing an incredibly high rate um, in our shelters yet. We've had one positive test in all of our shelters so far. Um, so hopefully the, the measures we've taken have been working. Um, this also includes having clear policies for providers, talking to everybody in our system so that folks can understand when they need to refer someone to medical respite or to a hospital, um, and trying to figure out uh, what the communication is between everybody. Uh, I'm seeing in the chat someone asked, how are places such as Yakima looking to have some of these programs go dormant without fully offlining them? And that was Kate Green. Um, we actually do not have any of our programs going dormant. Um, which has been amazing. Again, through sort of the combined efforts of increasing distancing and increasing sanitation, um, we really have, our providers have done an incredible job of reducing transmission. Um, we have thermo thermometers uh, to do, I, I don't know if it's daily everywhere, but ideally we're, we're trying to get regular temperature checks for people living in congregate settings. We're monitoring symptoms. Uh, we have relationships with testing sites to get people tested if they are symptomatic. Uh, we're increasing distance between bed space, uh, increasing airflow in sleeping areas, and increasing sanitation efforts and supplies. And none of our programs have gone offline um, or even really had to reduce any of their offerings, um, at least not the shelters, um, reduce anything dramatically. So. Uh, that's that's been really wonderful for us. Um, I'm, this slide is likely review, and I think I may have actually got these talking points from the, one of the healthcare for the homeless documents that I had looked through before. But I just wanted to um, take a moment to address the respite care that we're using. Um, as everyone here knows, folks experiencing homelessness are often at high risk for contracting COVID-19, both because they live in congregate settings or exist in congregate settings so often, and because um, they may have pre-existing health conditions and they may not have access to regular medical care and sanitation. So um, for us, being able to utilize the respite care in our community has been really useful. Um, as I said, we've only had one positive case in our shelters. Uh, we had some other cases in the housing programs. I believe there were two other cases in transitional housing, and that may have gone up since I had my last numbers. But um, having a respite program on call has just been really, really helpful, knowing that um, when we have a case, we have somewhere for them to go and get out of a congregate setting immediately where they can get medical support. Um, and also where we, we can have behavioral support on hand. Our one positive case that we got, um, unfortunately there were some, some additional difficulties in that the individual who was positive was not only living in one of our highest uh, capacity congregate settings, but was also um, had some behavioral health issues that made it so that they were not able to fully comprehend at all times um, the, the severity of them being infectious. So. Um, the additional behavioral health staff that our respite care can offer is a really, really helpful addition to the services that we can access through that. Uh, I wanted to touch really briefly on this Yakima Valley Nonprofits Needs website. Uh, this was the partnership I had mentioned before, the public-private partnership with foundations. You can see here our, our sheet that we've used to collate needs throughout the county. Um, nonprofit providers can request supply and volunteer needs here. They're posted publicly. We buy what we can through our grants and through our partnerships with found funders. 
and community members are also invited to donate things that haven't been purchased yet. So it's been really successful. We've probably been able to get over 22,000 items distributed to local nonprofits in the last month. Um, and we've met two thirds of all the needs that have been submitted so far. We do have some takeaways. Um, one is uh, to identify early on the unifying philosophies of trauma-informed care, and I'll, I'll let Rhonda touch on that briefly because I know that's something that she's really been involved in. For my part, remaining flexible and going month-to-month -month on agreements whenever possible and revisiting plans consistently has been important. This is something that's ever-changing. Um, and also staying in consistent communication across all of our providers and partners, like I said before, just keeping those uh, communication lines open and understanding what the system is we have in place and how we can respond together. So I'll pass off to Rhonda to discuss the first learning point. Yeah, thanks, Esther. The only thing, you know, I would say is one of the things that be, because there are so many um, mostly uh, mostly existing partners, but, you know, we're, we're somewhat um, have an advantage to some communities, I think, because we are, uh, even our metropolitan, our largest city, we're a medium-sized town, and so most of us really know each other. But when people, when folks come in, whether it's FEMA or National Guard or whoever, when you have new players to the table, it can be difficult on how you serve and how you reach out to a, a pretty vulnerable population. And so one of the things that we have done over the years is we have pretty regular trainings, community trainings around trauma-informed care. And we try to invite as many of our partners to join us as possible uh, so that we have sort of a set, a, a, a community standard of um, how we engage with our clients. And I think that has served us well over the years. And, um, you know, the incident that, that Esther was talking about on how we approach people with behavioral health issues and especially around, um, you know, these uh, around the COVID um, pandemic and how people react to it on self-isolation uh, can be very challenging. And so the more that we can share our philosophies and, and with different, across different organizations is only going to be helpful um, as, you know, hopefully it doesn't um, spread too far within this population, but if it does, we'll be better prepared. Thank you, Rhonda. And, and I would absolutely piggyback off what Rhonda said as well. This is probably something folks understand already, but asking people to enter isolation can also often be re-traumatizing, um, especially for people who have had issues in the past with um, abusive or controlling behavior and being told by a provider or by anyone that you have to stay in this room and you can't leave and you can't see your friends and um, we're gonna ask you to be here for possibly weeks on end can be really difficult. So bringing, um, bringing that trauma-informed care philosophy to that practice and trying to find ways to work with people rather than um, making it seem like we're imposing isolation. I know that Yakima Neighborhood Health has come up with some, um, some, some care kit uh, shopping list asks for our nonprofit needs website, and we're trying to find ways to get puzzles and games and other fun uh, distractions that we can be giving people while they're in isolation so it doesn't feel like something we're imposing or forcing them to do. Great, thank you so much. Uh, just an excellent example of, of uh, implementation there uh, under some incredibly challenging circumstances. So uh, thank you and I'd encourage people if you have questions uh, for uh, Rhonda or Esther, please go ahead and uh, put it into the chat window, and uh, I'm sure they'll be happy to answer any questions they can. Uh, next, we're going to turn things over to uh, Stephanie from uh, Hennepin County, Minnesota. Stephanie, uh, take it away. Hi, good afternoon, everybody. I'm going to talk a little bit about um, two models of medical respite that um, kind of what we started with and then how we've transformed to uh, expand the spirit of medical respite in Hennepin County due to COVID-19. Um, next slide. So prior to six weeks ago when this uh, hit Minnesota, um, and I guess the start of it, we were providing medical respite as guests in um, the Harbor Light Center, which is run by the Salvation Army. Um, this shelter has six floors, um, 
with two floors of just overnight shelter and then two floors of emergency housing, which is considered 24-hour shelter, uh, and then one floor for transitional housing. Um, our Health Care for the Homeless team has a clinic on the first floor of this building. Next slide. Um, this is an example of one of the respite rooms um, at the facility. It's mostly kind of like older hospital beds and everybody gets a locker. Um, some of the people receiving medical respite stay in more bunk style rooms on this floor. Uh, just one of the requirements is 24 hour shelter. So it can look a little bit differently than this, but it gives a kind of a good example of what that looks like. Under this model, again, we're guests in the space at Salvation Army and services are provided by myself, a nurse practitioner, an RN, and then we have access to other healthcare for the homeless services, um, such as substance use disorder, um, services, the box zone, uh, Minsher or navigation for healthcare, um, a SOAR specialist for social security applications, um, and then psychiatric medication management. Next slide. In our response to COVID in Hennepin County, approximately six weeks ago, we moved uh, 290 individuals into two hotels um, in the suburban county. These individuals were uh, identified as either being 60 and up or having uh, conditions that are known to have uh, extra complications due to COVID-19. Um, so these individuals were identified through uh, our collaboration with shelter providers from the large and smaller church shelters, as well as uh, healthcare for the homeless staff who have been working with these individuals. Um, my role now, uh, all of our respite folks actually moved to these hotels, is being the, the point of contact for triaging and coordinating any services or medical care or psychiatric care that people need while they're staying in this hotel. Um, so we've kind of taken a step back and providing everything via telehealth um, through healthcare for the homeless at these sites, but uh, are now covering a whole bunch more people. So it feels kind of like we're running a giant respite program. Um, what that looks like is human service staff are covering the hotels on the ground that were redeployed through our incident command structure uh, due to their work changing because of COVID-19. Um, they don't have a lot of background in homeless services, so we've been helping train and support and bridge that gap as we try to uh, respond to the needs that people have moving into these hotels. Um, then I just I wanted to touch on the COC a little bit. So this the whole process of this change has been through a partnership with our COC planners, um, other grant recipients, and partners um, that have really used the county board as a way to advocate and respond to COVID-19 and get these contracts in place so people have a space to isolate early on. Um, I do want to add that they are they have to be COVID negative to be in these hotels and so a big part of what we're doing now is helping create this culture of symptom monitoring and improving access to testing so that people can get to a, a quarantine uh, or COVID positive space as soon as possible to try to reduce the spread. Um, the other ways we are, are using our COC partnerships is right as this was starting, we've changed our coordinated entry process to uh, not use the VI SPDAD anymore, effective sort of immediately as there was other planning going on into what would work better for our system. Um, so now people are prioritized through HUD months, homeless and disability status versus uh, the VI SPDAD score. Um, so just trying to make sure that everybody has access to coordinated entry. Um, the priority list manager is looking at multiple people before making a final referral just to make sure that person can stay in contact and that it's a feasible referral to improve the time to housing, hopefully. Um, next slide. Um, so some of our biggest learnings is to work in these existing systems that already happen. Uh, we all can dream for a standalone medical respite program where we're in charge of everything from um, intake to discharge, but the reality of our systems is that's really hard to obtain. And so all of the spaces that we provide services in, we are guests in that space. And so just making sure to have good relationships and support the people um, to, for success. 
we really work a lot to support the staff that are, you know, really struggling with the severity of needs that people experiencing homelessness have, especially this older population uh, with a lot of chronic health care conditions. And so, like, learning really a lot about person-centered planning and what it means to provide care in a way that people have choice and dignity, um, even if it looks differently than how we would live our lives. Um, we think a lot about the, the rules and restrictions of these spaces, especially in a pandemic response. Um, so, for example, access to alcohol or smoking uh, and making sure that that's not putting the community more at risk. Um, and then really just creating this culture of caring where uh, using PPE and practicing and role modeling social distancing are ways of showing respect and care and not just um, another source of stress or trigger for trauma for people who have had the com larger community backing away from them for long periods of time. Um, and yeah, I think I think those are the biggest things. But uh, I, we're not sure how long people will be in these hotels, so it's hard to say what the outcomes at discharge are going to look like. But we we do have quite a few people moving into permanent housing from the hotels already, so hopefully that will be okay. Thank you so much, Stephanie. Uh, just to a quick clarifying question. Uh, you talked about on your changes to the your coordinated entry prioritization, you mentioned that you had stopped using the VI SPDAT tool and you mentioned two, uh, two criteria that you're using now. Can you repeat what those criteria were? You cut out just a little bit at a crucial moment. Yeah, absolutely. So this has been a larger conversation in our continuum for quite some time, um, probably since it started, right? But um, just a lot of people who believe that there's some inherent bias um, in the, the VI SPDAT tool or that it's re-traumatizing for people. Um, and now that there's been studies, you know, coming out to, to prove that, um, the community as a whole has taken a step back to try and come up with a better tool that will work for us. And in the meantime, we, you know, we stopped the VI SPDAT um, and are now using the, the number of HUD months homeless. Um, as well as having a disability and prioritizing from there. So a very, very simple prioritization process. Uh, yeah. Uh, thank you very much, Stephanie. Uh, I know, again, if you have questions for Stephanie or for uh, our previous uh, presenters, Barbara, Esther, and Rhonda, uh, please feel free, or for any of our speakers today, feel free to toss them in the chat box, or if you have any recommendations for us or comments for us, uh, or if you have the answer to somebody else's question, uh, that's great. Uh, please go ahead and, um, and uh, put those up in the chat box. Uh, next, we're going to move on to uh, some HUD updates. Uh, so I'm going to turn things over to Marlisa Grogan from SNAP's office uh, to start us off. Marlisa? Hi, everyone. It's great to be here with you today. We wanted to start our update with a reminder of the encampment guidance that we have posted on the HUD exchange. There have been reports around the country that have identified an increase of encampment sweeps. And so it, it just bears repeating um, that it's how important it is to continue outreach and engagement to people who are experiencing unsheltered homelessness. Um, also to not clear encampments unless housing solutions have been identified. Um, that goes for um, clearing encampments in general, as well as um, having individual, individuals move from encampment settings to, um, to sheltered settings or congregate sheltered settings. The, the best option is to have a housing solution um, and not clearing encampments otherwise. Also, sanitation and social isolation measures, they can be followed even in encampment um, and unsheltered settings. So one key measure would be to, um, to reconfigure encampment settings so that tents are set up 12 feet apart. Um, symptom screening can also be done in unsheltered settings. So um, whether you're partnering, partnering up with your healthcare for the homeless provider, um, or if you're doing um, symptom screening um, with your street outreach teams, that's another important step that can be um, used to help ensure that people are being linked to the health to the healthcare that they need. 
um, providing education on transmittal of COVID-19 and offering hygiene products is another key function of street outreach teams. And service coordination with healthcare partners is really important um, uh, for street outreach workers, but also um, at the COC level in making sure that there's the connection between street outreach projects as well as local um, communi community health care providers. Next slide, please. So there, there are many communities throughout the country that we're aware of who have successfully, successfully set up non-congregate shelters, and um, they're, they're making robust non-congregate shelter strategies um, come, come into their, uh, come in, coming into their own. And they're, you're, they're utilizing FEMA funding for people who are COVID positive, who are symptomatic, or who are um, at high risk for health complications due to COVID infection. So um, this, is, this is still a very important step if your community hasn't taken it um, yet. And it should be a coordinated effort among um, continuums of care, COC, uh, COCs, um, emergency management, and your public health department. Um, people who experience homeless, homelessness have really benefited from these protective measures, taking them out of unsheltered situations or congregate sheltered situations where there's not um, space to um, quarantine or isolate in, in, in your own in individual spaces. Um, and working with local public health and emergency management is also going to be a key step to make, making sure that there's a continuation of this resource through state emergency response and um, collaboratively planning for transitioning people who are homeless from non-congregate shelter into housing. Um, I can't stress enough that it can't be an afterthought, but um, part of rehousing needs to be a part of the plan from the outset. Next slide, please. And with that, I'm going to turn it back to you, Norm. Norm, are you on mute? Norm, you're on mute. I thought I had all this unmuting stuff mastered, and then I seem to have regressed <laughs> over the past two weeks. Uh, thank you for catching me there. Um, so I want to just pause for a second, not quite as long as I just paused, but pause for a second and sort of reflect on the fact that I, I think a lot of communities are in this space where we've been working on uh, the uh, immediate response and emergency mode and just trying to keep people safe and, uh, and you know, uh, disease-free and prevent the spread of COVID. Uh, and that has been an incredible task. Uh, at the same time, we're also having to think about how do we, you know, make sure that we are uh, housing people, that we are moving them out of uh, danger and out of places where uh, they continue to be at high risk. And so uh, I want to talk a little bit about sort of the high priority areas for moving forward with CARES Act funding, uh, but with our work more generally. And uh, just want to point out, uh, I think the, the, uh, Marlisa and, and Emily uh, pointed this out already, but, you know, there's a lot of stuff you can do in encampments. Uh, and in shelters, and I'm specifically speaking about shelters with shared sleeping areas where the risk of transmission is high, there's a lot you can do to slow the spread or, uh, or prevent uh, new cases of COVID. But at the same time, those, those situations are inherently more risky than people being in individual units, uh, either in non-congregate shelter or in housing. And one of the uh, opportunities we have with CARES Act funding is to really look at uh, housing options to reduce the number of people who are in those high-risk situations. And so those are the kinds of things I think we're, uh, we're preparing to think about and start uh, activating. And I know many of you have already started that process, uh, but I wanted to talk about a few of the things that are sort of the first steps along that process, bringing together key stakeholders, to do planning and alignment. There are a lot of different kinds of resources that are out there and uh, some just very simple, straightforward planning to figure out which resource is going to pay for which things uh, can really help you get organized going forward. 
Uh, at the same time, uh, in, in, when you're thinking about planning, having people with lived experience and people who represent marginalized communities, having them at the table is really going to make uh, your planning much more effective uh, and much easier and uh, will definitely pay dividends over the medium and long term. Uh, some simple data looking at how many people are in unsheltered locations or in emergency shelter, non-congregate shelter, alternative care sites. Uh, I don't think it has to be that sophisticated, but having that general sense of the overall numbers you're looking at uh, and then coming up with goals for each of those scenarios uh, is really, really, uh, I think, simple, straightforward, but also important and will help you uh, help you plan going forward and kind of identify how many resources are going to be needed for you to be able to meet your goals. Uh, there are certainly some resources that are on the table that are very uh, uh, specific to, um, to homelessness and uh, areas around homelessness, including the ESGCV resources. Uh, and a reminder, there's going to be another allocation of funding that we're going to announce. Uh, soon, and so uh, there will be more ESG CD resources out there. There's CDBG, uh, the Community Development Block Grant, uh, which uh, some of those funds have already been announced. There will be more to be announced, uh, but they can fund a lot of uh, the same things that ESG can fund. And of course, we have our COC resources, uh, including permanent supportive housing. So looking at how do we identify those people who are in those high-risk situations, uh, including unsheltered locations, including those shelters with uh, shared sleeping areas, to figure out how do we uh, how do we prevent the uh, spread of COVID. I was pleased to hear that in uh, Yakima that they had very few cases in uh, in their emergency shelters. Unfortunately, we've heard from many many other uh, communities that they have uh, seen a lot of uh, COVID cases in their emergency shelters, and I think. Some people have been a little surprised at how quickly uh, some of that spreads. So moving on to the next slide. Uh, in addition to sort of thinking in a larger way about how uh, what what uh, what you're going to implement and what you're going to spend money on going forward, uh, there are some important early uh, things you can do to help set the stage for success with your rehousing strategies. Uh, one of the really important things is going to be to engage landlords and property owners uh, as quickly as possible. Uh, I will say that landlords and property owners are also terrified about what's happening uh, in our economy and with uh, the continued uh, spread of COVID. And, you know, there's a win-win here where if you can uh, find a, uh, a program, a rental assistance program, uh, to attach to people experiencing homelessness, that becomes a much more attractive option for landlords and property owners, knowing that there's some guaranteed income, uh, because obviously very little is, is guaranteed uh, these days. Looking at streamlining coordinated entry uh, is, an, is another one. I'm uh, glad Stephanie brought it up. Uh, you know, we have um, focused a lot on uh, being really sort of nuanced and sophisticated in our coordinated entry because uh, we really had to prioritize resources. We had a lot more people needing assistance than we had resources to help them. And, uh, but that's changed a little bit. We have a lot more resources on the table and, uh, and that the level of, of, um, of prioritization we've been doing and sort of really nuanced prioritization maybe isn't needed as much anymore. I will say, uh, you know, that uh, we'll look at uh, trying to do some content on coordinated entry in the future. Uh, one of these office hours goals, uh, office hours calls. Uh, but looking at uh, prioritization, thinking about how how do we make sure that our prioritization reflects the risk of COVID and the risk of uh, you know really poor uh, outcomes from COVID, including uh, death or uh, really long term and severe disability, uh, and then focusing on where are the inequities in our current system, either in COVID response or in our homelessness system more generally. Uh, and really seeing if we can focus resources on the places we see the most inequities. Uh, and then again, focusing on uh, other partners who we can bring to the table. Uh, I think our presenters today did a great job of really identifying the partnerships that were needed to, uh, to bring things together. The same thing is going to be needed on the rehousing side. Uh, and then, of course, tracking housing placements uh, and with enough detail so we can really 
see if we're seeing equity, equitable uh, outcomes there. Uh, so uh, I'm going to turn things over. Marlisa has a couple more updates we're going to present right now. So I'm going to turn things back to Marlisa for a minute. Marlisa? Hi again. Uh, we had a couple of important um, bits of guidance come out over, the, over this week. Um, so we wanted to highlight them for you here. The first is the memorandum from our Acting Assistant Secretary, John Gins. Um, it's, uh, it provides a waiver for ESG and HOPLA um, related to con plan submission. This is consistent with the waiver that's already been granted for the Community Development Block Grant Program, which um, relieves grantees from submitting their, um, their strategic plan portion of their consolidated plan along with the housing and homeless needs assessment and market analysis. So that just makes um, our programs consistent with the rest of the formula programs. And it also um, strongly encourages recipients to get started with their substantial amendment submission for CARES Act funding for ESG CV funding. Um, we mentioned on the last office hours that you have um, a variety of ways that you can incorporate your ESG CV funds into your con consolidated planning submission. Um, one would be incorporating them into the current annual action plan that you're developing. Um, but by far the most expedient way to, um, to get through the hoop of your, your plan submission is to do a substantial amendment to your most recently approved annual action plan. For most people, that's going to be their 2019 plan. For a very few number of ESG recipients, that will be their fiscal, fiscal year 20 plan, which you can also amend. Um, we just recently um, issued instructions. They actually were posted yesterday to the HUD exchange. Um, and it takes you through the step-by-step -step process for amending your, your your submission, your action plan um, for CDBG, ESG, and HOPLA. So please um, take a look at those instructions if you haven't already. It, um, it will provide guidance as well for the, the, um, the plan or the process that the, the field offices are using. If you have any questions at all, please contact them or you can contact us via the, the HUD exchange if you have any problems. And you will see that there is a link um, in the in the IDIS in the IDIS instructions to interim ESG CV certifications, which are also linked to um, right here on this slide. We posted um, interim ESG certifications to reflect uh, two flexibilities provided through the CARES Act. The first being that match is no longer required um, is not required for um, CARES Act funds for ESG CV funds. And the second is, um, is relaxing the requirement for the minimum period of use for temporary emergency shelters. And so um, the, the, the certifications that are posted on the HUD exchange uh, should be used for your substantial amendment to incorporate your ESG CV funds. Next slide, please. And uh, a waiver for CAPER submissions has also recently been posted um, to HUD.gov. This will give an additional um, 90 days for, for your submission. Um, so instead of it being due 90 days from the date, um, from your program, your end date, you have an extra 90 days for, um, for your CAPER submissions. So you can access that waiver memo um, at the link that you see right here. And with that, I'll turn it back to you again, Norm. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, next, we're going to, we have one more update from uh, Department of Veterans Affairs. Karma Heitzman is going to give us the update. So Karma, uh, take it away. Thank you so much uh, for this opportunity to, to speak with all of you for a few minutes. Um, I'm actually going to provide updates specifically to the employment services uh, that we provide to veterans enrolled in our homeless program. So a little bit different conversation than that we've been having. And I will uh, put a fact sheet uh, link in the chat box 
So I oversee uh, what's referred to as homeless veterans community employment services. And as opposed to being a distinct program um, within VHA, it's actually just represents about 200 employment specialists who are embedded within the homeless programs across uh, the country um, at, at VA medical centers. So these staff are tasked with providing both direct employment services to homeless veterans that we serve and also being a bridge to community resources. Um, we partner very closely with Department of Labor programs um, as well as uh, state workforce boards and state Department of Labor's. So the idea is not to reinvent the wheel and to develop a whole new employment program, but just to make sure that the veterans we're serving have access to employment to improve their housing stability, um, help reintegrate them into the community and, and also Im improve quality of life. So the goal is not to have every veteran we serve working um, as I like to say, bankers hours, so the nine to five 40 hour a week job, but to be working enough to supplement any other sources of income they may have and to um, help them maintain um, housing when, once they've obtained it. Um, what I wanna just touch on as an update today is that obviously um, employment is taking a hit in many ways, not just for the veterans we serve right now um, with the many millions of people that are currently out of work, um, and also because we're not, uh, VA is not providing face-to-face um, -face services in many cases um, for our veterans. So we've had to really do a pivot uh, to provide virtual employment services. Um, we do have a number of platforms that are available uh, to, to be able to provide that um, to the veterans who, even if, if they're in, in apartments within the community through HUD bash or if they're in transitional living situations or even sometimes in um, shelter situations, um, we're trying to make sure that they have still have access to employment specialists. Because even if there's not a lot of available jobs in their communities right now, um, as we're looking forward to, to eventually moving into to a new situation across communities, we wanna make sure that the veterans we're serving are well positioned to be able to reenter the workforce um, at whatever level makes sense uh, for that individual. So our staff have been very creative in terms of developing online um, classes for resume preparation um, or to help people um, set up USA Jobs uh, profiles if they're interested in federal appointment. Um, they've been doing virtual job fairs. Uh, I've heard of staff that are uh, working with veterans who have flip phones that want to fill out an application for an employer that is actually hiring in their community and they're, uh, you know, bringing things up. The, the staff member will bring the application up on their screen and the veteran will tell them what to put in. So some very creative um, kind of virtual approaches um, to being able to provide those services. Uh, we want to make sure we don't lose the momentum that we've gained, um, especially in the last five years, the employment rates for the veterans that we're serving in VHA homeless programs have really significantly improved. I think um, for a number of reasons, one um, that we're, we're really talking about employment more, that discussion is happen happening earlier with veterans, ideally at the, at the point of first outreach or first contact, because it may take a while for some of our veterans um, to obtain employment given, given some of the barriers they've experienced in, in long-term periods of unemployment. So, so we're really trying to make sure that, that those conversations happen early and regularly, and um, that we continue to provide follow-up once they obtain employment. So our, our kind of uh, mantra right now is that maybe a veteran is going to have a harder time getting a job, a homeless veteran right now, given the economy and the number of, of um, jobs that have gone away, but hopefully that is not going to be the case. So we're, we're doing everything we can to make sure that we're still reaching out and providing those services and, and also providing hope. I think that's one of the things we really encourage our staff to do is to help our veterans think about the future and think about as um, we have a better handle on COVID and, and people can, can start re-engaging to some extent, we want them to have something to look forward to and something to plan for. And employment can be a really nice opportunity um, 
to to provide some of some of that forward looking and hopefulness. So that's that's one of our our big um, pushes right now. Um, and and the other thing that we are aware of is that uh, despite the number of businesses that are are closing or or jobs that are temporarily on hold. Um, because of the needs um, from the pandemic, there are employers that are actually beefing up hiring um, be because of, of particular demands related to COVID. So we're making sure that staff um, are aware of those and that if veterans are interested in, in pursuing those, they, they have assistance in, in doing that. Um, so that is basically the, the brief update on what we're doing in terms of employment. I realize it's it's a bit different than most of the conversations, but it, it's my job. I, I like to see myself as kind of the flag waver um, for the employment uh, piece of the house and the idea that that homeless veterans can can go back to work, can work, often want to work um, in in some capacity, and and need access to those services and the supports to make that happen. And, and that's basically what our um, staff across the country are there to do. So I'm going to go ahead and place the um, uh, the link to our fact sheet um, that also has uh, all of our um, the our staff are actually listed uh, uh, by state by location on our external website so that our community employment coordinators um, can be easily accessed uh, by external partners. So we, we try to be um, very available, um, not hide, because sometimes it's hard to know who to call at VA. Um, so that information is all also available on the fact sheet. So that's that's my um, update in terms of VHA employment services for homeless veterans. And Norm, I'll turn it back to you. Uh, thank you so much, Karma. We have a lot of questions to get through, so I'm going to just jump into questions. Uh, so I want to sort of, there are two things at the top I just want to uh, talk about. We've had a lot of questions about or, and comments about coordinated entry in the uh, comment box. Uh, there's a lot to talk about here, but I, uh, somebody did ask about whether we would have guidance and more information about coordinated entry uh, with respect to CARES Act funding. I will say we are working on some uh, documents to help clarify uh, what you can do with coordinated entry and what we would suggest that you do with coordinated entry. We have been looking at whether, uh, whether there would be any waivers or different requirements needed. I, I will say for the most part, uh, we found that most of what uh, people have been asking for uh, is something you can already do with the, uh, under the existing coordinated entry rules. So uh, we will be providing some, and we are working on some uh, guidance around that. Uh, so please stay tuned for that. Uh, we've also had some questions about uh, doing homelessness prevention during eviction moratoriums. This is a really complicated thing to talk about in just a few short minutes here, but I will say we are working on some additional uh, guidance on that about when you can serve people, when you can't, and, and how that all works, uh, along with some different sort of uh, suggestions about uh, program structure that uh, that that will sort of address a lot of the problems that people are telling us about. So that's just on coordinated entry and on, on sort of using prevention in eviction moratorium uh, uh, scenarios. I would just want to say we're working on some guidance. We will talk about that uh, more in future sessions. I want to though turn things over to or or turn a question to Emily uh, from CDC. Uh, we, we have a question about whether uh, CDC is tracking the number of persons who have been found uh, COVID positive who are experiencing homelessness. Uh, and this, this particular question was asking about whether that data is available by state. Uh, can you talk about is, is CDC collecting uh, information on, um, on COVID uh, positive in, in, uh, among people experiencing homelessness? and uh, what are you seeing? Is that data available? Uh, what can you tell us? Thanks. Yeah, that's really good timing on that question because we um, rolled where uh, our systems here at CDC are evolving and um, developing to match the pandemic. And uh, we rolled out data collection that will um, capture that information recently. So uh, we don't 
have anything to share right now in terms of those numbers, but we'll be able to get them. We'll be able to get that information and we'll absolutely make it a point to share it on this forum. Um, the place that you might look, there's a lot of state and local health departments that are capturing that information and they might have it on their websites. So it's worth checking your local area to see if they're already capturing that information. But if not, stay tuned and we will get some information to you. Great, thank you very much. Uh, we also have a question for Stephanie. Um, first of all, thank you uh, for your great presentation. And uh, we have a question about training for the human services staff that you mentioned. Can you talk about how you're doing that training and sort of what resources you've used for that? Um, it's kind of case by case, it seems like, uh, just helping reframe what people's experience is on the ground and sharing our insight based on um, our, like the spirit of medical respite and healthcare and, and how we see things. And so it's more as behavioral issues arise or medical concerns arise versus any blanket training. Because they are mostly, you know, social workers and other professionals from other parts of the county that, that do have some, you know, basic direct service history. Great, thank you. Uh, we have a question, Marlisa, I wonder if you could talk about, uh, answer this question about, should CDBG be tracked in HMIS? And is that an eligible cost for CDBG? Uh, can you talk about whether people are required to or whether we would recommend people, uh, if they're paying for, say, non-congregate shelter or even emergency shelter or some other activity through uh, CDBG, should they be putting that information into HMIS? Sure. The CDBG program does not have um, an HMIS participation requirement. Uh, if any, if that shelter happens to get any ESG money, of course, um, that HMIS requirement would, would then apply. Um, CDBG can be used to match ESG funds, and it can also be used um, for HMIS in limited cases, um, so limited, in fact, that it's really best that you consult with your um, local HUD CPD field office if you're attempting to do something like that. Um, it, you know, the, the activity would have to meet a national objective in basically all of the criteria, um, all of the requirements under the CDBG program. So. Um, while, while it is possible, um, you should really be in close contact with, um, with your field office and um, if not also the program office at HUD headquarters to make sure that you do that um, properly. But then um, I think the other, the other question was, um, you know, I, I think the other thing to mention when it comes to um, HMIS participation for a CDBG funded program um, would also be that it's it's encouraged so that if um, if the provider is willing, of course they should um, they should definitely participate in HMIS if at all possible. I think I answered all the questions, but let me know if I missed anything <laughs> more. Uh, very good. I, I think you did as well. Thank you, Marlisa. Uh, so we have another question about the status of NOFAs, HUD NOFAs, including. COC, YHDP, and unsheltered NOFAs. So let me do the best I can here. I just sort of want everyone to recognize we're still working on stuff. Things are unbelievably uncertain at, at the current moment, but uh, let me walk through some of these. For the unsheltered NOFA, that is on hold for, I don't know, probably a while. Uh, so I don't expect to see that uh, coming out anytime soon. Um, so, you know, if you if you were thinking about planning or preparing for it, uh, I I wouldn't do that right now. For YHDP, uh, the Youth Homelessness Demonstration Program, I know many of you have applied in the past and are interested in applying in the future. We are planning on uh, doing a uh, YHDP no for this year. We actually plan on uh, doing sort of two uh, rounds of funding at once. Uh, that's not something we expect to announce in the next uh, next few weeks. 
um, but we do sort of, we are working on it and we do uh, want to put those out. We know that there are a lot of young people experiencing homelessness and uh, uh, you know, we, we want to be able to get funds out there to be able to serve them. So, again, not in the next few weeks, but we are, uh, we are still planning on doing that. The COC NOFA, to be honest, is the most uncertain one right now. Uh, we are looking at all our options. We know that the COC NOFA process is a, a lot of work and it takes a lot of effort. Uh, locally, and uh, at the same time, the, the funding is unbelievably important. We are looking at all the options we have, focusing on uh, the option that will require the least amount of disruption at the local level, uh, but also ensure that uh, people, that, that projects are continue uh, to get funded. So, we're still working on that. We hope to have something uh, identified uh, at some point soon. Uh, I, we honestly will give you information as soon as we uh, have something to share. Um, but unfortunately, we don't, we don't quite know the answer yet. I will say, uh, if you're right now focused on COVID response, uh, that is the right thing to do. Uh, and, you know, we want you to continue to prioritize COVID response. And if that means putting off, you know, the preparation you would normally do on the COC NOFA, we absolutely support that. Uh, so that's the status of the NOFAs. I wish I could be a little clearer, but uh, that's, that's all we know and can share at this point. Um, so we had a couple questions. Brett, I wonder if you could help us with some questions about using ESG for different kinds of uh, uh, properties. So in one case, somebody, let's start with the first one. Somebody asked about whether you can use uh, ESG on city-owned property uh, through use ESG rental assistance on city-owned property. Uh, can you talk about whether that's, that's allowed? Sure. And, Marlisa, I may need you to also uh, pop in here. But you are, in general, allowed to use ESG rental assistance under either homelessness prevention or rapid rehousing to pay for rent on a unit that is owned by the recipient or subrecipient, but there, you're, in those cases, you're not allowed to do the rent reasonableness test. You're not allowed to do your own HQS inspection. You have to find other people to do that, um, but that is the general rule of thumb unless Marlisa jumps in with more information or a flat out no. No, that sounds good. I would just say, you know, just watch conflict of interest and make sure that it's not otherwise subsidized. Great, thank you. We also have an interesting example. Uh, somebody is, has an agency who's leasing a college dorm facility to use as temporary shelter. Uh, and the, the lease agreement sort of separates the monthly rent from the property taxes, uh, which sounds like kind of an unusual arrangement, but um, uh, would, would the property tax in that kind of arrangement be an eligible reimbursable expense? I don't know, Marlisa, do you happen to know the answer to that? I believe we've answered that on the AAQ, but I don't remember what it is. I might be able to do a search in the next eight minutes, though. Put it in the chat. Great, thank you. Uh, we also have a question about using uh, COC rapid rehousing funding to pay for arrears uh, that, that come up because of, of COVID-19. Brett, can you talk about, is, can you use COC program rapid rehousing funds to pay for rental arrears in the COC program? Sure. So one of the waivers that we released on March, well, the memo came out March 31st. I think we released it um, on April 1st. Uh, does allow up to six months of rental arrears as a supportive service under um, housing search and counseling. So, and it's to help people obtain housing. Uh, so you can pay for up to six months of arrears if you request the waiver. And as a reminder, to request use of this waiver, you just have to submit an email to the email box identified for your field office. Um, and then two days later, you can do it. 
Uh, if you don't have a supportive service budget line item as part of your rapid rehousing grant or um, your PSH grant, whatever type of grant you have, you can contact your field office and request an amendment so that you can start paying for those costs as well. And as a reminder, there's a special COVID-19 simplified amendment process on the HUD exchange as well. Great, thank you. Um, I had some questions I wanted to direct uh, to Esther Aranda in the, uh, uh, regarding um, sort of working with alternative care sites. And we had a question uh, from Kentucky uh, where they're using uh, hotel rooms, but in some of their rural areas, they're really, you know, it's just a few hotel rooms. And so like how you staff something where, you know, everything's kind of spread out and uh, there aren't that many, you know, people at a particular time. So, you know, paying for staffing can get a little complicated. Can you, do you have any suggestions for how people should think about, especially in rural areas where like the scale just, you, you just have a different way of thinking about how you do, uh, you do program uh, implementation and like you can't pay for an FTE or it's not cost effective to pay for an FTE when it's just a few people. I don't know if you have suggestions for how or if you've come across that problem and can talk about how you've handled that. I'm going to go ahead and defer to Rhonda since she's overseeing the programs that hire folks. And unfortunately, Rhonda had to leave. So, Mr. Do you have oh, okay. <laughs> any insights on, on that? <laughs> um, well, I'll give it a, I'll give it a shot. Um, you know, we don't have, at the county, we don't have any folks that we directly hire. We contract um, with sub-grantees to do our services. Um, so, as I said, Rhonda would be the best person to ask. But um, I know that we have talked about having folks be on call um, and, and setting up a plan. The first and only so far positive case that we had in a shelter was at, like five or six o'clock p.m. on a Friday, everyone had gone home, and uh, Rhonda was able to call her team in and have some folks scramble and set up a room within a few hours. So we we do have, um, well, I should say, Yakima Neighborhood Health Services does have some plans in place for having people, um, their current staff, understand that at this time they're they're potentially going to be asked to be on call um, for expansion of additional respite. Uh, again, Rhonda would be able to give a lot more detailed response, but just from my side of the partnership, um, being able to see them spring into action, that's, that's been really, really helpful. And we currently are working on the contracts and, and the development of our plan, and, um, you know, it's sort of all of our language supports um, reimbursements on a, for, pro, for reimbursements for services rendered on an as-needed basis. So we, we don't have any um, rooms that we're just setting up and leaving empty. We're kind of making our partnerships and our, our putting our ducks in a, row, in a row in advance so that the hotels who we'll be using for respite or the facilities that we would be using for respite understand that they're also sort of on call and um, we have a few options available for us. So if we do need to add an additional room, we can tap the staff necessary and we can tap the space necessary and then only be paying for the resources that we're actually using. Great, thank you. Um, uh, and thank you for sort of uh, taking that question uh, like on the spot there. Uh, some of these are, I have to say some of the, as we do more of these office hours calls, the questions do get more challenging. Um, so, uh, Brett, I just wanted to ask, we have time for one more question I wanted to ask about, uh, we have a question about use, uh, paying for internet access. Uh, it wasn't clear about whether it's COC or ESG funds, but can you talk about for each of those uh, about what's eligible as far as paying for internet access? Uh, and we may as well throw in cell phones as well. Yeah, I was gonna say the closest I can get you all is the FAQ that we published the other day and that I put in the chat earlier. Um, we just published an FAQ saying that we can pay for cell phones and wireless plans. 
um, so long as they're owned by the recipient and then low and the plan is in the name of the recipient or subrecipient uh, and then loaned to the program participant. Um, and it's as long as it's needed for program participants to receive their services. And this is under the COC program. Um, we haven't said anything for ESG yet. Uh, so I would say to the extent that the phone can support internet and the wireless plan includes internet, that that's how we can pay for it. We aren't at a place yet where we're able to pay for internet inside somebody's individual unit. Great, thank you. Uh, I want to just take a minute and thank all our speakers today, uh, and especially want to thank our guest speakers, Esther, Ronda, and Stephanie, uh, for their great presentations and really uh, gave us a nice flavor of like all the things you have to consider and the, the challenges and benefits of, of running um, respite care and alternative care uh, programs. Uh, and definitely want to thank my colleagues from uh, CDC and VA uh, and National Healthcare for the Homeless Council. I uh, want to thank our SNAPS team and people behind the scenes. And most of all, I want to thank uh, everybody who is out there. You guys are just doing great work trying to keep homeless people safe. Uh, and continue the work of ending homelessness in this country, and uh, you guys do amazing work. So uh, did want to say if you have uh, any if you have any topics that you would like to share uh, or you would like for us to talk about in future uh, sessions, I would love for if you could just sort of drop something in the chat box, uh, and we would love to hear. Uh, about what you'd like to hear about, and so we could provide helpful content in the future. Uh, if you do, if you think of it later, please feel free to just email to anyone you know in the SNAPS office, and uh, we will we will get it to the right place and, and uh, include it in our planning work. Uh, so thank you very much. Uh, happy Mother's Day to the moms out there, uh, and we will talk to you soon. And that concludes the webinar.